You have located Geekfest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. There she is. Guess what? Daddy is going to get you dressed for school today. We are descendants of the gods. This land was always ours. But we must never relent. We're nowhere and everywhere. You're from Virginia, right? I can tell. You're special. We are the future. You. You're not like the others. That's over. What are we doing? What is the plan? everybody and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone and today we are going to do a movie review. We recently watched the movie Antebellum and boy were we surprised by this movie that I ended up doing an entire show about it. So warning, there are going to be spoilers on the latter half of this film and this is also possibly a very controversial film. So get ready and let's go. What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You are a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That spawn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the force will be with you, always. Let's talk about antebellum. First off the bat, I remember hearing that term many times, but I never really got the definition of what that meant. I knew it had something to do with the South and the Civil War and something like that. And from what I understand, what that means is the pre-Civil War time that gets romanticized a lot for how beautiful things were before the Civil War in terms of the landscape and the gallantry and the things that the South seems to have been, I don't want to say mythically described, but the way that people seem to want to remember it for that manner and not for what happened, obviously, at the same time, pre-Civil War and during the Civil War. So it's a way to romanticize how something used to be. Very, it's a very Nowadays, it's a very political description, if you will of having these nostalgic feelings for how things used to be good a long time ago, as opposed to now, you know, that kind of, that kind of feel, that kind of description. So a couple of months ago, I watched a trailer. I don't know how it ended up on my, on my radar, most likely uh, some kind of Facebook uh, feed that was 
promoting the, the film. And it was unusual because on one hand, it had elements of Civil War plantation slavery themes, but it also had some very modern themes, some very modern settings with modern people. And on certain shots, it seemed to combine the two. There was a very modern thing happening, which is a, an airplane, and people watching it from a field that looked like slaves. So it was kind of like a weird back and forth duality to the trailer. And overall, the trailer was more or less promoted somewhat as a suspense horror kind of film. And that's how the film is promoted, which in a way I think it shouldn't just to keep it more surprising, you know, as to what happens in the, in the, in the movie. Now, keep in mind, this is all while, you know, COVID is happening and theaters are closed. And obviously I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't go see this movie in the theater unless all of a sudden it had a lot of good reviews. I've, I've gone, you know, I, I've seen some horror films in the theater provided that they get really good reviews, not your typical, you know, slasher kind of film that I don't have time for that sort of thing, you know, and at least in a movie theater. But when all of a sudden somebody comes up with a new twist, let's say on horror. Yeah, I'll, I'll go out there and, and take a look. So the movie kind of disappeared from my radar for a while. And at the same time, I can't go to the movie theaters anyway. All the theaters are closed and you don't want to really be in there under these conditions. Uh, so little by little, reviews started trickling in because apparently the film was either on on demand or it had just started maybe being uh, available for rent or anything like that. And there were a lot of bad reviews. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, that's a shame. I thought, you know, you know, I thought this was going to be one of those horror films that I was going to kind of chase after and you know it kind of again left my radar again that was the second the second time around but recently i don't know where it is that it showed up again it might have been once again on my facebook feed or maybe on my netflix queue or you know coming soon or that sort of thing and there it is it's on netflix so i ordered it and i watched it. this is a difficult film to tell you about without spoiling it and, and i am going to spoil it near the end and at that point, you guys should say, all right, I don't want to spoil it, or I want to spoil it. If you're not going to watch the film and you're interested in it anyway, you can listen to it. If not, skip a few minutes. But this is the main reason why I need to spoil this film is because I do want to talk about something at the end of the movie or, or something about three quarters into the movie, really, to tell you the truth, the third act of the movie. So first act, it's Civil War. You're at a plantation. The film opens with a quote from William Faulkner, and it says, The past is never dead. It's not even past. Interesting. Okay. I had to look this up because I was not familiar with that particular quote. I knew the name Faulkner, but uh, I wasn't too keen on the uh, on the quote. So the movie opens in a, in a plantation. It's one of those... Um, shots that some directors do sometimes which is that non-cut shot it's a long shot that takes you through different locations without cutting in the camera eventually you will get a cut but this is one that goes all through so you're at the front of this mansion in the south there's a woman wearing a you know beautiful long colorful dress and a little girl skipping through the flowers and they both then walk through the back of the house and there's some confederate soldiers marching in, in the direction of the rear and around the back you get a whole bunch of what are probably most likely slaves setting up this huge tent in the backyard of the house and there are these white sheets that are hanging and there are slaves that are kind of standing very still while, while the soldiers walk in front of them and then you have a confederate flag being raced in the backyard and off to the side of that you also have a smokehouse which is kind of like a small closet like outside shed made out of brick and there's smoke coming out of it so that's probably where i imagine they burn their garbage or something unless they're cooking something in there i'm not sure then the camera continues to follow the the movement of people and then you have the slave quarters all the way at the far end where you have a lot of slaves uh, doing work, resting, doing whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing at that moment. And you do see the movement of 
a horse with a woman on top of the horse kind of on her belly, like sideways, like she's being moved from one area to another. And that brings us to the back of the cotton fields that are back there. And that's the first cut point we get in the film where we see some kind of a struggle or argument or or something is happening between a woman, a black woman, and a Confederate soldier. And on the other end, there's a man, a black man, with he has this thing around his neck, which I think I've seen in some historical photos. It's like a it's like this harness with spikes with little bells at the tip of the spikes, you know, the tip of these these metal rails. And I guess it's supposed to let you know if he's moving or not because the bells will always make a sound or some kind of, it looks like some kind of torture device or something. And they're dragging him and he wants to be with her and she wants to be with him and they're separating them. And we meet a, I don't know if he's a lieutenant or a captain or whatever designation he is. He engages in some dialogue, basically explaining, I guess, I guess to the audience, you know, by, you know, by this exchange that apparently she had tried to escape. And as a result of that, he shoots her right there in the field. Then they tie her up and they drag her with a horse to another area. And the, the man who might have been her husband is freaking out. He's just losing it. And they drag him away too in a different, in a different manner. Now, they do make it very prominent that when she's struggling with the soldier, she has a gold chain with a cross that she's wearing. So that's something that I guess they want us to see. This movie is directed by Gerard Bush and Christopher Renz. This is their first film. I believe they're like video. They shot music videos and some other stuff. The lead of the film is Janelle Monet. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. From what I understand, she's a musician. She's a pretty well-known musician. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of her. I was not aware of her. But as an actress, she's really good. She is the lady on the horse that's witnessing this. And she is the lead of the film. She's The, the story is basically about her. So the captain or lieutenant, his name is Jasper. Let's call him Jasper because that's, that's the character's name, is played by Jack Houston. I know him from Boardwork Empire. He played the, I forget the name of the name of the character. Uh, he played that that soldier that has a mask half his face because half his face is gone, if you remember. That's what he was, what I remember him. But apparently he's done a lot of work recently. Apparently he was in um, in The Irishman and some other f- current films. So he he's uh, he's a good, he's a pretty good actor. He's, a, he, you, you, you hate him in this movie. He's really nasty. The film is beautifully shot and you can tell the way that things are framed, the thing, the way that things are lit they try to look as natural as possible. You get a lot of scenes where you see the trees and the Spanish moss hanging, and you get that feel of the way that the moss moves back and forth. It's almost like, reminds you of like a person that was hung moving back and forth. You get a little bit of that. So that's really effective. We then get to know the lead uh, character a little more. She is inside taking care of the cabin and in walks what appears to be some kind of a high ranking officer of the confederate army he comes in and you can tell something bad's about to happen here and he gets into it with her about her name and the fact that she had something to do most likely with the the attempted escape of the other woman before and Part of what he is attacking her is her is about her name. She will not say her name. And after some fighting, and she he even at one point brands her with a uh, branding iron with the letters BD, which is very important later on. She relents and, and says her name, the, the name that he wants to call her by, which is Eden. Uh, that's the name. I guess that's supposed to be her slave name. So the next day, we get more sequences of the slaves at work in the fields. They are picking cotton. And in the background, you can hear explosions like cannons going off or sure. I mean, first I thought maybe it was thunder, but no, it's it's like cannon fire. And they're all kind of looking around to see what's going on. And the soldiers that are guarding them, especially Jasper, he's they're like, oh, everybody go back to work. You know, so why don't you sing one of those songs? 
you guys sing or something. And they, the guy that was separated from the, the beginning of the movie, that his, the, when the woman was killed, he starts whistling a tune. And some of the other ones seem to kind of go along with him in terms of that particular tune that he's singing. We then go back inside a little more of the cabin where Eden is doing some really strange things. She seems to be greasing the door hinge, putting grease on the door hinge. And outside, a whole bunch of new slaves get brought in to the plantation. And that's where we meet Julia, another new slave. And the, I guess the, the wife of the plantation owner comes by and she's all kind of really weird acting. And she's got a little girl next to her, I guess it's a daughter. And she's like, what would you like to name her? She says, well, let's name her Julia. It's like, okay, your name is Julia now. So they're all kind of dressed in basically rags. And Julia, let's call her Julia, she's kind of looking around and she's trying to kind of connect with somebody and they're being told the rules. Jasper tells them to, you know, all of them, you're not allowed to speak to anyone. You're not even allowed to speak to each other. You only speak when they allow you to speak, when a soldier allows you to speak. That's when you speak. And we see them also, again, in the fields. But something that I was a little confused about, being, it looks like they're taking whatever cotton it is that they're picking, and then they're throwing it in a bonfire. So at that moment, I was like, well, is that some kind of a war thing where they're burning the cotton in case the union troops come in and they don't want them to take the cotton so it's that possibly what they're doing i don't know but that was a little strange in the beginning of the movie we get more shots of eden in the house uh, in the shack and she is kind of scratching on the wall and feeling these weird scratches and you know we can't tell what that is and she's doing this weird thing where she's kind of avoiding certain floorboards like to walk from one end of the room to the door she's kind of skipping over certain floorboards to get to the door which doesn't really you know make much sense and julia comes to talk to her and they have this weird exchange where julia seems to be implying that they're waiting for her to decide what to do even though they kind of just met more or less like a day ago or something she even says to her that i know you so it's kind of really kind of weird what's going on and she also tells her that she's pregnant that she was brought into this place already pregnant which just makes things a little more difficult for everybody the night comes and we get a shot again cinematically this is great how they shot it and how they lit it and this is very appropriate now the thing to keep in mind is that this film was made a while ago this film was made at least over a year ago which means all of the events that happened this summer all the george floyd events had nothing to do with this film however there's a lot of stuff that's been happening over the last couple of years that play a very direct role in this film so nighttime comes the confederate troops are coming back from their assignments or their battles or whatever it is they're coming from and they're marching all of them holding torches and they're chanting blood and soil now at this moment i'm thinking oh wow they're making a connection directly to the charlottesville incident of a couple years ago where the white nationalists were marching with their tiki torches at night with the anti-semitic uh rants and the blood and soil thing so i'm thinking oh this must have came from some kind of weird civil war chant or something. And it's interesting how they're tying it in here. You know, so you get a point of reference as to where that came from. So they come into the to the plantation and they, they are now ha sitting all around that tent that they were setting up in the opening shot of the film. And they're basically having the, the big dinner and their general comes in to kind of talk to the troops and to cheer them up and to tell them, look, we captured, uh, this is this, this union jacket I'm holding is the sign of our victory and blah, blah, blah. And he's telling them how they are going to triumph, you know, over those evil, uh, northerners and how the Southern troops will replenish, uh, the South by giving up their blood to the, you know, to this and that. And, you know, he's giving them this, this, this military kind of rara speech and they're all you know in perfect attention and holding still and all the female slaves are in there dressed up nice and serving everybody and the general basically implies at the end of his speech that when you're done eating you can take any of these women and do whatever you feel like it you know kind of hint to everybody and there's a pair of 
soldiers and one of them is kind of teasing the other one. There's like a shy one and a not so shy one. And Jasper overhears them going back and forth about one of them not wanting to do anything and the other one wanting to do stuff, wanting him to do stuff. And Jasper says, all right, that's it. You take her and get back over there. Go back to the room and, you know, take care of business, basically, is what he's saying to her. And he does. The guy goes to the room. He enters. She's there. Julia. This is Julia that they're, that he's um, confronting. And he's super shy. He doesn't want to talk. He doesn't want to say much. And he doesn't want to do much. And she's kind of trying to talk him into leaving her alone, basically, and to helping her, maybe. He, she's telling him, you know, you, you seem nice. You don't seem like the rest of them. But when she says that, the guy kind of seems to something clicks inside of him and he starts roughing her up and telling her, no, I am like them. I'm exactly like them. I'm better than, you know, he's all of a sudden kind of proving to her how much like them he is. And he hurts her. He hits her and she's down on the floor. And then he leaves telling her, you tell them that I did everything. And if you, if I catch you telling them the truth, you know, you, you something's going to happen to you, that kind of thing. And Eden next door is overhearing this whole thing through the door. So the next day, they're in the fields again picking the cotton, and Julia starts to miscarry. And Jasper says, all right, get her out of here. You know, he's like, yeah, whatever, get her out, clean her up and get her the hell out of here, that kind of thing. So Eden brings her back into one of the cabins to, to get her, you know, out of the fields. And in order for Jasper not to get too upset with her and, and maybe even attack her, Eli whispers cracker to him. And... Jasper's like, what? What did you say? So he kind of starts up with him to kind of divert his anger towards him instead of her. So he gets all kind of confused as to who he wants to scream at at the moment. So he's like, okay, fine. Get him out of here and I'll deal with you in a minute. And what's interesting here is that they almost get into a fight, the two of them. And there's a little exchange of curse words, the F word and the S word. And that is something also that in the film, I was like, wait, these are... If I watch some type of historical film, I, I, I try to pick up, you know, what the cursing of the time would be like. And it's interesting that here they're making it, I don't want to say modern, because I couldn't really tell you how modern that kind of a curse would be. I mean, I know it's been on around for maybe over 100 or more years, so it kind of could be that way. But it's also something that you could say, well, it's just so you can make it better understood you know, for the audience as to the fact that these two really hate each other and they're exchanging in these sort of words. And there's a really cool shot when they almost go at it with each other, where Jasper and Eli's, their faces are really close to each other. And in the distance, in focus, which is really cool how they were able to maintain everything in focus. This is something I learned later uh, by watching the supplemental material is that they, the cinematographer actually used lenses from the movie Gone with the Wind because he wanted to get that look and he says one of the things about those lenses specifically the ones he wanted were lenses that would allow you to stay focused without having to manually change the focal depth between one and the other sometimes you do that on purpose sometimes the director wants you to focus on one character and then another character says a word and they focus on that character because they want your eyesight to go from here to there they're forcing you to focus on what he is focusing manually focusing on but here this is a great shot because as soon as those two get closer to each other because it looks like they're about to fight or something out in the distance two guys with with guns all of a sudden raise their rifles aiming at him and it's really cool how they maintain that shot in frame for those amount of seconds and then everybody backs off really cool shot anyway i'm getting a little too technical here so now that she's uh, been taken away uh, jasper's gonna deal with eli and he sends them over to go clean the uh, the smokehouse that shed that that we saw in the beginning and once again speaking of the curse words let's say eli is, is able to quietly give him one final cracker ass cracker insult without him hearing it to kind of get it off his chest in the smokehouse, Eli goes in and starts cleaning it, but he kind of sees in the middle of this kind of uh, charred remains of whatever it is that they were burning in there, he sees the cross and the chain that belonged to the other woman. 
again, I don't know if the other woman was his wife or, or a friend or whatever, but he picks it up and he completely breaks down because then he understands that all the stuff on the floor, all those ashes were basically her body that was burned. That smokehouse is not only, I, I assume, something to get rid of garbage, but it's something to get rid of bodies. All of these slaves that get killed in one manner or another or die, they throw them in the smokehouse and they just burn them up. So he takes the chain, puts it on him, and he's completely, you know, destroyed in terms of mentally how how devastated he is to have found that chain. So from there, we go to Eden in the cabin once again at night. She is being basically raped uh, by the general, and he's done, rolls over. They both go to sleep, and she's there, cameras on her face, and you hear a cell phone. And this is where we get into act two. She turns over to her nightstand and there's a cell phone. And then the the camera kind of zooms out a little more. And now she is in a modern setting, dressed different. Everything is different. She's in a very modern, beautiful bedroom. Her husband is on the other side of the bed. Her phone is going off. She picks up the phone and starts talking to the phone. The way that this is done is is very tricky because when we focus on her face while she's in the cabin, we don't realize it at the time, but we're already focusing on the modern face, not the slave face. This is the modern version of this character. And the lighting is done that way. It's all kind of set up that way. So you're not sure what you're... It almost sounds like in the slave shack... The phone is going off in the shack, but it's not. It's it's now it's happening in modern time. At this moment, we're thinking we kind of know it's the same actress, so we can't really tell. You know, if we're dealing with some kind of a I don't want to say time travel, but a remembering or a you know dual lives kind of thing going on, you know, past lives that kind of stuff. But this particular character, whose name is Veronica, couldn't be any more different than the previous character that we met completely modern you know this is taking place now basically she's waking up it's a beautiful beautiful home very artsy looking paintings on the wall they have a young daughter she seems to be getting ready to go to work and he is getting the little girl ready for school i guess or something like that and we we see inside her house you know uh, she's got paintings of like a woman riding a horse and even there are even pictures of her Doing like horseback riding or jumping, you know, when horses jump over obstacles and that sort of thing. So we see that. So she's very, uh, we, we can kind of tell she's very physical. She's very fit. She's very successful. I can't tell if it's the husband or the wife or whatever, but they live in a gorgeous home. And while they're in the kitchen, all three of them, the daughter uh, and the husband and her, she's also kind of watching an interview apparently that she gave, I guess it must have been the previous day having to do with race. It was a like a point-counterpoint kind of thing. And you start to get a picture of she is kind of like a, some sort of an activist, maybe a teacher, maybe um, expert on race relations or something like that. And I guess the type of person that would be booked on a show, you know, to talk about the the subject. And she's getting ready basically to go on a trip having to do with, with her job. And she's getting her computer ready and all that stuff. And she she opens up the computer. The computer has a huge um, a butterfly uh, logo on it. And she opens up the computer at a, at a certain point to talk to somebody, which appears to be an interview, more of a research interview or a question interview that you would have. In other words, it's not like she's on the air on a TV station like she was the previous night, let's say, but more like somebody is asking her questions. And... This woman who is basically sitting in a car and is asking her a little bit about her background and about her points of view having to do with racial relations and and the history of race and all that stuff. And the woman is acting really weird. And you can kind of tell that, you know, you know, Veronica is being very nice and calm, but you can see how she's changing during the interview because she realizes that this woman is she's just weird. 
it seems very adversarial, the conversation and the tone, the ways that she's asking questions and she's being very dismissive about it. And she's kind of saying, oh, that color of your lipstick suits you, you know, but it's it's super passive aggressive the the tone of that conversation and she gets to the point where she's like you know what you know what company are you with exactly you know because she doesn't i don't think she's sure she's entirely sure what this interview is about so the, the interview is getting weirder and weirder and she asks her about the book she just wrote it's a book about inclusion you know racial inclusion that sort of thing and then her daughter walks into the screen and she's like oh is that your daughter over there she's so cute and blah 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 and she's like all right, I'll, I'll see you soon. And and they end the interview, and you can tell that Veronica was getting a really bad feeling out of this because that woman was so strange and so creepy, basically creepy about her tone. So she, I guess she kind of dismisses her as just a, some weird kook or something. So she's getting ready to leave, and her daughter gives her a picture to take with her, which is her, you know, it's a typical kitty picture of, like, the, the, the mother, father, daughter, and, a, and an airplane flying, you know, by... Uh, because that's the the plane she's going to take to go to, I think she's going to Louisiana to go to, on, to this conference, you know, having to do with work and the thing that she does. So once we get to their destination, the hotel, then you start to get these sequences where little subtle things happen that don't necessarily cause a scene, but I think they're there to, to, to kind of point out to you that, yes, things are different between that time that we were just watching before, you know, the Civil War time, and today. But, for example, she's checking into the hotel, and the the girl at the, at the counter is kind of making her wait, and a phone call comes in, and she picks up the phone and makes her wait, so she kind of delegates her to a like a a, a sec like not as important as the in other words you figure that the person in front of you is the more important person than the phone call coming in so but no the the girl kind of says kind of feels like oh oh, okay hold on uh i'm gonna take this phone call and then hi ma'am and and you can tell she's being very she's saying the right things but beneath that there's something else bubbling up again it's the whole passive aggressive thing you get a lot of that and behind her there's a huge picture a portrait you know a, a painting of a plantation which is very ironic because we were just in a situation we were just in a location like that before so once she gets to the hotel she meets up with her friend played by let's see if i don't butcher this name sibdibi gabor ray <laughs> i can't do this one this is a tough name but you might remember her. Uh, she was a, a nominated for a cameo in the movie Precious. She, she had the lead role in Precious a, a, a number of years ago. So she's her her best friend. And, you know, her best friend is like planning, you know, what are we going to do next? And this is what we're going to do. And this is we're going to do this. And we're going to do that. So when she gets there, you almost think that we're back to the original location because they give you this shot of her kind of upside down, kind of in some sort of distress. It's very dark. And then the camera kind of tilts and she's right side up and we're kind of back, you know, the camera backs up a little more and no, she's at a hotel room practicing yoga with a, with a yoga instructor. So it's, it was kind of like a tease of, of, are we back in that time or are we back to the normal time now? And it's just her finishing up and then her friend walks in and they're both making plans for what they're going to do tonight because she's there to make a presentation and her friend is very different than her. Her friend is more, she wants to have fun and she's just a little more outspoken than her, let's say. She's a little more professional. Her friend is a little more out there. So there, there is a, a personality difference between the two. And while she's there, she receives a delivery of flowers. And they're a little odd because the flowers look like they're kind of simple flowers, not very fancy flowers, but they also have little chunks of cotton. So it looks like it, it, it might have been done with actual cotton, like real cotton stems, you know, into the bouquet. And she's, I think she at the time is thinking, she asked the guy who's delivering, he's like, oh, uh, thank you. Who are these from? Or I forget what the guy says, but it is kind of weird the way the guy looks at her. I think at the time she figures it's they're from her husband. She must, he must have sent her, you know, good luck type of thing. And they also meet up with another friend of hers that is there also. She is more, I believe, there to kind of work too because she's, I think she's also a writer, kind of like her. And she talks to her about how the, how, you know, your past ancestors are always there and how it, you know, your life kind of ties to the past and blah, blah, blah. 
So, you know, there's a lot of that going on. We are we are meeting her her circle of friends. Granted, these are all friends that are she's meeting outside her home. They're, you know, at, at a far away location. So, basically she's at that hotel to give a presentation on a book that she just put out. And that information is very slowly trickled out. We don't get that all right away. It's like, well, why is she there? Oh, she's there for work. Okay, what kind of work? Oh, it's a book. She's a writer. That's why she was being interviewed in the first place. Okay, we get it. We're kind of making these connections a little clearer. So at a certain point while she's out of the room, I'm not sure if it was be- while, while she was doing her speech or afterwards when they're out to dinner, Elizabeth, which is the woman that she was being interviewed by earlier, before going on the trip, she creepily sneaks into her room and she's looking at her stuff. She's throwing stuff around. She's picking up her lipstick and putting it on herself. She's using her bathroom. She, at one point she takes like a hair out of her hair and just like dumps it on her bed. And I'm thinking, is she trying to like plant evidence or something? I couldn't tell what she was doing, but all I know is she was doing some really creepy, weird stuff. And it seemed as if Maybe she's like some kind of stalker or something because maybe she's obsessed with this woman or something. It was a very weird things that she was doing in her room. And then she kind of messes up some stuff and leaves the room. So then we see her giving her her discussion and we get the gist of her thing now. She is a an expert in, I guess, racial history and, and empowerment of women and kind of like that's her thing. That's what she writes about. That's what she works out of. And, you know, she's got her PowerPoint presentation. She's got a huge audience of people. They're all clapping, enjoying themselves. And, you know, she's got that huge butterfly logo. Again, you know, part of the uh, the one we saw before in her computer. And she gives a speech and everybody's happy. And then the, the speech is over. She meets up with her friend again. And she goes back to her room to get ready to go to dinner with her friends. And on the way up to the room, a little girl gets into the elevator with her. The little girl is a little weird looking. And she kind of looks a little bit like the girl that we saw earlier. And she's kind of telling her, you have to be quiet. And then she walks out of the elevator and she's dragging a doll by the neck. And obviously the doll is black. It's a black doll. And she's dragging it by the floor. And she gets into her room and she sees that the girl is like at the end of the hallway. And it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of The Shining of the, those two little ghost girls, remember, uh, that are kind of weird, evil looking girls. And and that's the kind of feeling you get. It's like, is she having some kind of mental breakdown that she's starting to imagine these images or, or things from the past? You know, does this have to do anything with what her friend was telling her about? You know, you're always connected to the past, you know, through, I guess, through spiritually or whatever. But... Anyway, she gets to her room and then she goes off and she meets up with her friends and they go to the they go to a restaurant and as they're about to walk in the restaurant a, a horse carriage just almost runs them over which is like oh boy that's weird but it was just uh, I guess one of those carriages that you rent you know like in New York that type of stuff so they go inside and the hostess brings them over to the table and you can tell the table this is three people and the table they they're giving them is a kind of like a small two-person table but they almost like basically added another chair to the two-person table and it's against the wall next to the kitchen so the kitchen door is constantly like there and again you know is that the type of thing you know it's obviously not the good table and this is obviously a good restaurant an expensive restaurant and her friend, the, the the first friend, the one we talked about first, she's like, okay, hold on a second. This isn't the table you're going to put me on. And she goes through this whole thing with the waitress because Veronica's ready to kind of take over. She's like, no, no, hold on. Let me take care of this. And she's like, and so she puts on her her full, you know, attitude, which is the way she is. It's it's the personality of the character. She She's not really getting into a fight, but she's kind of putting the hostess in her place. And she's like, no, you're not giving us this table. You're giving us that table. And the hostess really doesn't fight too much. She kind of gives in and says, okay, well, we'll put you on that table then. So again, it, this is another example they're giving you of for whatever reason. Now, granted, you've got to remember that you're dealing, you know, Two of the people on the, uh, uh, Veronica and her friend are black and the other girl is white. But, and you can kind of say, well, this is kind of like a, another example they're giving you. Very similar to the hotel example of the, uh, you know, making you wait on purpose, which you could kind of say, well, who cares? A big deal. You know, you wait, you wait. Okay, fine. Then you go to the restaurant and they're like, they're putting them on the crappy table. And it's like, well, why are you putting me on the crappy table? So again, it gets resolved. 
so everybody's fine. But she even mentioned, but she mentions to the to her friends, you know, while they're while they're getting their drinks or whatever. She's like, yeah, it was kind of weird at the hotel. You're like everything was a mess. You know, they didn't change my room. Things were out. You know, things were on the floor. Uh, you know, things were dirty. This or that. They didn't like turn her room. And then the other two were like, well, well, our rooms were perfectly fine. I don't know what you're talking about. So that's, again, she doesn't know exactly what's happening at that moment because she doesn't understand that somebody actually broke into her room, more or less. So while they're there, somebody buys them a drink. And a guy from across the bar, you know, there's the bar, there's a TV in the back, and there's stuff going on on the TV. And the guy sends the drink over to them. And... The guy walks up to them to say hi. So he's basically hitting on them. And, you know, I forget which one exactly he's hitting on. But her friend, you know, the, the more talkative one, let's say, she kind of sets him straight. So she doesn't really, like, like throw him out outright. But she kind of tells him, well, if you're going to do this, this is how you should do it. Instead of ordering me a drink, you should have figured out what we're all drinking. And then you would have ordered us a bottle of whatever it is that we're drinking. So she kind of... Blows him off, but in a, in a nice, polite way, but it's also a flirty way. So now what's funny is that while you're having this conversation, you don't see the guy's face. You saw the guy's face when he was far away, but he didn't look familiar. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you who he is, but for some reason, when he gets close to the table, they purposely kept him off frame. So it's over. They're done eating. They leave. They're taking two different cars because Veronica's leaving the next day, so she can't go partying with her friends. So the other the friends take a different car. They drive away. Veronica takes another car. These are like Uber cars or whatever. And while Veronica's in her car, she's texting her husband. She's, you know, to thank you for the flowers. Now, the music is very loud in the car, and she keeps telling the driver, can you please lower the music? So her husband, you know, texts back that he didn't order any flowers. She say, He says, it must have been one of your fans or something, you know, one of the people that buy your books. And she was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So she keeps telling the driver once again to please lower the radio because it's too loud. The music they're playing is very loud. And at that point, the car makes a turn and all of a sudden somebody sneaks up behind her who's apparently been hiding in the back seat. And it's Jasper. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) It's the same guy that we met earlier, the mustache, the, the lieutenant, whatever his rank is. And then when the driver turns around, she is the the same lady that was in her room. And the more you think about it, she's also the same lady that was in the plantation. The one that was picking the slaves and asking her daughter to give them names. Again, the girl was the same girl. So at that moment, you realize, okay, what is happening here? Something's not right. (laughs) Something is definitely not right. Now, one thing to keep in mind, right off the bat, you're understanding this is the same person. Because now all these people are in the same world. And the question now is, well, is she kind of like going back and forth in time with the same people that she's meeting in the present? Are these people kind of also in the past? And you can't really, you know, make that connection. So that's all you know at this point is that People seem to be repeating themselves in two different time frames. So all of a sudden, we're now back in the past. And we find out that Julia, after her miscarriage, Veronica goes looking for her, or Eden. I mean, her real name is Veronica, but her slave name is Eden. Whichever at this point, it doesn't really matter because we're not sure exactly where we're at or how these things are happening. Uh, She finds her inside one of the cabins. She hung herself. And what's interesting other than the fact that she hung herself, it's very sad, her ankle has the tattoo of a butterfly. That's interesting. Meanwhile, in the cotton fields, everybody's still picking cotton. They're all doing that miserable work. And they start to hear a noise. And at first you're like, well, okay, it might be a, another um, cannon fire or anything or something like that. And everybody looks up in the air because it's something coming from the sky and you see a plane going by. So you're like, what the hell is going on? So they look at the plane and then a few seconds later, they just look down and continue doing their work. So at this point, you're thinking, what is going on? Are are we jumping back and forth? Are we not only jumping back and forth in time, but are we in some kind of a weird scenario where we're kind of blending the two time frames now are the two time that's this this is how i was kind of putting together the film are we blending these two times is there some kind of weird sci-fi aspect to this that is blending the two times together this is basically the third act of the film this is the part where 
we saw the plantation, we saw the modern time, and now we're seeing how those two things are connected. So she meets up with Eli again, and she's like, okay, we got to do this. This is it. Because she kept holding off and she kept telling Julia up to this point, just to be patient. You got to wait, you got to wait, you got to wait. Because they were, she was planning some kind of an escape from the plantation to go, I guess, to the to the free, uh, to, to head north, to escape to the north. But, you know, Julia was very impatient and obviously she was horrified of the things that she was going through there. But at this point, she's committed. She's like, that's it. We have to do it. We're going to do it this time. We're going to do it for real. He t- tells Eli, okay, tonight, this is when we're going to do it. And every now and then, you can also see her that she goes to this wall. Again, the wall from earlier on. And there's some scratches. It's like it's like a, like a like some scratched on designs that she's been making on the wall. So that night, she's in bed, basically being raped by the general because that's the thing that he does <laughs> that's how that world works she's there for him just like all the other women were there for the soldiers when he's done with her he just rolls over goes to sleep and they both kind of go to sleep more or less and she's kind of waiting him out so at a certain point when she realizes he's asleep snoring out she gets out of bed and the way she gets out of bed is she kind of climbs over him and she kind of does it in a backwards move. So she's doing it backwards. And that's where you understand the yoga that we saw earlier, these weird poses that she is, because she has to get out of bed. She has to basically hop over him without moving the bed or without, you know, doing any, no- making any noise. So she kind of bends herself over him to land on the floor. And then as she's walking out, as she's walking through the cabin, she's purposely skipping certain floorboards as to not make noise. And she then opens the door, and the door is very quietly open. And that those are the things that she was planning all along. If you remember the the, the weird skipping of, of the floorboards and the greasing of the door hinge, it's all part of the plan to escape. So she goes out there and falls as- until they both kind of fall until he falls asleep she just pretend to fall asleep but at a certain point we hear what i think what we think is a cell phone a ringing sound the general gets up goes outside and on his horse he reaches in and grabs a cell phone and he's kind of muttering to the phone you know this is you know you shouldn't call me here this isn't the place for this and blah 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 and this and forth and don't do this and do that he's giving instructions to somebody on a cell phone and you're like oh shit at this point you're like okay what the hell is going on here? Because now we're completely in a whole other world. So he gets back inside and she pretends to be asleep while he gets back into bed and then falls asleep. And then when she knows he's asleep, she gets up. So she leaves the cabin, goes outside, grabs the phone and tries to make a call. And she dials 911 because the phone is locked. It's a cell. It's like an iPhone type, obviously a modern phone. And she seems to know exactly how to work this phone. So you're like, okay, wait a minute. This isn't a time travel-y kind of situation here. She knows exactly what this thing is, just like the general knew exactly what this thing was. She's calling 911. She's like, you got to help me. I've been kidnapped. And the police, the connection is really bad and it can't get through very well. But as she's trying to make the phone call, she's also waiting for Eli to show up. And Eli shows up and then they hear soldiers approaching. And the soldiers are the same as before that we met earlier, the shy guy and the other guy. So they, they drop the phone and they make a run for like the fields, the, the, the cotton fields, to go hide in the cotton fields. And the soldiers pick up the phone and they're like, oh, somebody must have dropped. They're like, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to have this, you know, put it away, get rid of it or something. Because if you get caught with this, you're going to be in big trouble. So again, you're trying to get more of a picture of what's going on here. These are These are people that understand what this is. So you're not dealing now with any form of time travel. You're dealing with people that are in present time and who are dressed up as Confederates, but they're purposely trying to pretend that they're not in the present. So they go looking for them in the cotton fields and they're hiding and they're kind of looking for each other and then they get away and then they kind of can't find them. And and one of the soldiers walks away and leaves the other one alone and the other one's alone for a few minutes. This is the guy who's the shy one, the one that remember that hurt Julia. And Eli fights with him and kills him. So then they return to the cabin uh, to try to see if they can get that phone to work again. And she realizes that she needs to unlock the phone in order to be able to call 
to make an actual call to her, a number that she, she knows, because for whatever reason, 911, she can't get through. So they go back inside to be able to kind of put the phone to the general's face so they can open the phone, they can unlock the phone. And in the process, they get into a fight with the general. The general eventually kills Eli, but she's able to stab the general as he's coming out of the cabin. Pretty serious wound. And then she's able to put the phone to his face, unlock the phone, and make the phone call while the guy's just sitting there bleeding out. So... She's having the same problem. She's calling her husband. She's having the same problem. But she's able to send her husband the GPS location. And her husband's like, where you been? What's going on? She's like, I've been kidnapped. And died. She said, we've been looking for you all this time. We have no idea. So it's, you're, you're, again, you're putting it together. You're putting the picture together. This is a real place. And she was kidnapped, which is what we saw earlier on with, you know, in the car. And apparently brought to this location for this whatever nuttiness that it is going on in this place. So... After she's able to make the phone call, she's ready to get out of there. She's going to get on the horse. But before leaving, she goes inside and grabs the union jacket that that the general had as a trophy. She puts on that jacket and she cuts down the Confederate flag that's right next to the cabin, puts the general on the Confederate flag and drags him over to the smokehouse, which is really a crematorium. This is where they're disposing of bodies, basically garbage and bodies. So she drags them in there. And he even tell, you know, up to the last second, he's telling her, you know, we're always going to be here. You're never going to defeat us and blah, blah. You know, he's giving her the the Confederate spiel, you know, that they're, you, you're never going to get rid of us. We're always going to be, you know, victorious or whatever. And right about when she's ready to start to set him on fire, she hears a couple more soldiers coming by, including Jasper. So... She's like, oh my God, you got to help me. Something happened to the general. He's in the, he's in the smokehouse. You got to get him out. So they both run in there to get him out and she locks the two of them in there too. So now you got all three of them, the main bad guys of the film. And she sets it on fire and walks away. The whole thing is on fire. You hear them screaming. You know exactly what's going on in there. She gets on the horse, rides away. As she's riding away, it's starting to be the morning because this is all happening at night, but now it's, it's the morning is coming. And... As she's riding, there are other soldiers now pursuing her on horseback. But what you notice is that the rifles that they're shooting with, they're automatic fire rifles. That's one of the first things I'm like, wait a minute, these are not even muskets. These are just normal, modern rifles. So they're shooting at her. And because, again, earlier on, we saw all those pictures of her, you know, riding horses, she's able to kind of lose them and some of them fall out and some of them uh, fall off the horses and get hit by trees or whatever. And, And so she's down to only one person pursuing her. And that is Elizabeth. And she's shooting with regular guns. And she gets to a point where she kind of catches up to her and she's looking for her and she sees the horse. So the two of them start fighting. You know, it's a pretty uh, standard, uh, you know, confrontational uh, scenario. And, And she's telling her how her, you know, her, you know, they had this great plan and everything was working fine. And her father decided to go and find her because, you know. It was kind of like, we, you know, one thing is kidnapping people that are not that important or that well-known that wouldn't generate so much attention, if you will. But her father specifically wanted her because her father is a senator. And he specifically, you know, hated her, basically, from what I understand. Not so much from the dialogue, but when you kind of put it all together. Because she was more than just another black woman. She was a black woman that was empowering other women to be more out there. And she was more of a danger, more of a threat. So not only did he want to bring her to this place, but he wanted her to be his particular person that he was going to enslave and rape and do all that stuff too. Uh, So they have their, their fight. And you get to the point where where she's able to kind of put the rope around her neck, Elizabeth's neck, and drag her with the horse. So she's dragging her through the forest. And at a certain point, they ride by a a statue, a Confederate statue of Robert E. Lee. And as they're riding by, boom, she bangs Elizabeth's head on the statue. And Elizabeth is dead, completely dead. And she continues to ride the horse and continues to ride the horse. And all of a sudden, she's Writing, and this is all done in a very slow motion, you know, and and the music, again, I love the music in this film. The theme is great. It's, I mean, I have 
many themes that I love of many different films, and this is going to be one that's going to be there because they did such a great job with the music. But it's slow motion, and it's a battlefield, and it's it's a Confederate and a Union battlefield, and you're like, what the hell's going on here? But as she's entering the battlefield, there are signs that have like a cell phone with a line through it. So it's like no cell phones are allowed. And as she's entering the battlefield, she sees that the people, that, that, that there are other people still pursuing her, that they kind of stop when they get to the edge of that designation. So they kind of, they don't want to go into that area. They kind of, kind of start squirming back into the forest. So she's riding through the battlefield. She's riding through the battlefield and she's noticing, yeah, these people are, they're all dressed up, but you're not really seeing anybody getting hurt. It's, it's basically a, a reenactment area somewhere out in the, in the forest. And you get to an area where it's like all the cars are parked. And people dressed up as, you know, not in costumes, but like modern people that are coming there to see, I guess, the reenactments. And she's kind of looking around, going, you know, trying to understand what is happening. And then in the background, you see a couple of police cars coming. You see the sirens are wailing and she's kind of walking towards them. And as she rides out of the main field, there's a sign that says Antebellum, Louisiana Plantation Reenactment, you know, Battle Reenactment. And it says Blake Delton, Owner. And that's the end of the film. Now, as the credits roll, they show you a couple of, maybe two, three shots of the FBI checking the area out, searching the cornfields, getting close to the house. And then you see a tractor demolishing the sign, the designation sign that I just read to you. So that's basically what you're dealing with here. To me, this is a movie very much like, let's say, a good M. Night Shyamalan type of movie. The twist of the movie is realizing that what just happened here happened out of order. So in other words, the entire second act, the modern time act, is the beginning of the movie. Once she gets kidnapped, now you're in the beginning of the movie. And then when the first act is over, you jump to the third act. Now, there's, yes, there's, there's, there's going to be a number of problems. <laughs> there's going to be a number of questions that get asked with this film that, that even I would ask, and that is, it's a horror film. So for it being a horror film, it doesn't have to be perfect in terms of completely logical. There has to be some logic, obviously. you got to have some logic attached to it. But if this was a drama, it would completely fall apart because there, were, there would be so many things that you're like, well, what are the odds that that would happen? Or what a coincidence that this happened? You know, that kind of stuff. So you can't get too crazy with coincidences or, 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 or things of that sort. But because it is a horror film, you can get away with it. It's a thriller, suspense horror, let's call it. One of the biggest pitfalls that I found in the movie is, again, how would that work? In other words, how do you get that many people that want to be able to recreate the South Civil War slave conditions like for real so but you can say well yeah i mean there's lots of people that are doing these these reenactments the civil war reenactments so you do have the i guess for a lack of a better word your civil war fanboys out there but then how many of these fanboys are would be willing to take it a notch up a step further and create these environments where they can kind of get away with it that's when you deal with horror now that's when you're dealing with you know, movies like The Most Dangerous Game or stuff like that where these rich guys have this uh, land and they're kidnapping people and they bring them in to kill them and then you never hear about them. Even movies like Hostel and stuff like that where if you have enough money, you can create these conditions and secretly do these things. Okay, I get that theory. Would it work? I, I doubt it because you figure sooner or later somebody's going to mess something up and somebody will get caught and the whole thing will just explode. Plus, given the fact that the general, we later find out, if you look carefully enough, he is a senator. And there are certain scenes in the movie that they're hit. There's lots of little Easter eggs all over the place, which is why it's cool to watch the movie a second time because then you can, you can pick out all these scenes. And in the supplemental material, they go basically line by line. But when Elizabeth turns on her cell phone, the screensaver says BD, Blake Denton. As the initials of her father. I mentioned this before, the fact that they make a point of the gold chain for the first woman that is killed in the plantation that we see, that should have been also a hint of something unusual because you wouldn't imagine a slave being allowed to own a gold chain. 
it would have been not right, you know, in terms of it would have been stolen. Plus, a slave, especially if they're coming directly from Africa, that was a pretty, I don't want to say modern, but elaborate item to have that would have been stolen, like the second that somebody would grab that person. So it was a little unusual. And it, again, it should have been a hint for me that something was off. And it was, it looked, I remember it did look a little strange, something, you know, a little, a little red flag went off, but I kind of got kind of set it aside. The guy that buys them the drink at the restaurant, the TV behind them is doing an interview with Senator Blake Denton. But you never paid attention to that because you're kind of distracted by the guy who's ordering the drink. As they're driving away from the restaurant while she's being kidnapped, there's a huge mural on the wall that says, like, I think it says something like Blake Denton for, uh, for re-election or something. There's a big drawing of his face. But it's kind of worn and old, so you don't really see him. So there are all these little hints that are uh, sprinkled all over the place. And that's one of the things I want to do as we conclude this. I want to go over some of these Easter eggs that we kind of might have missed. When the slaves are singing the song, the whistling, from what I heard, the song is what's referred to as the Black National Anthem, which I never knew existed. Uh, that's a, it's a real thing. And it's something that, you know, how would they have known that? Well, because it's a modern song. It's not something that they would have sang back then. So... As a historian, you would know that sort of thing. And the guy that's Eli, as a slave, in reality, he's at one point they refer to him as professor. So he's probably somebody who really knows what's going on and knows a little more of the history of everything around them. The burning of the cotton, which at first I thought it was something that they were doing so the North troops wouldn't get to it. No, they were doing it because they just have no need for it. They're not running a real plantation. So once they pick that cotton, they're burning it. That's why it seemed a little strange. The overall speech, I think, and the colloquialisms that are being used was also something that kind of came back to me every now and then. And I mentioned that also like the swear words and stuff like that. There was something about the speech that didn't exactly match. If I think of, you know, more dramatic, notable films, 12 Years a Slave, films that are more contemporary but have to do with slavery those filmmakers try to adjust the language and the speech to that era here it kind of felt very modern and it's the type of thing that you could say well it's just poor filmmaking that they're trying to portray this era but they're not talking exactly or as close to as they would be talking in that era not only the soldiers, but the slaves. Now, granted, the filmmaker is purposely not showing you, you know, the slaves slipping or being able to communicate with each other, even though they're not supposed to, and talking about what just happened to them, because that would ruin the movie, you know, it ruins the, the twist. But, you know, I forgive that because you're, you're building this, you're building this house and you're presenting this house in a certain manner, and that's what you're doing to the audience. You're giving them this riddle you know this puzzle to put together and same thing with the soldiers you know you you don't want to see the soldiers talking about oh what are you doing this weekend oh we're going to the game we're doing this we're doing that you know that kind of chatter eventually you do get that when the cell phone comes out but the speech patterns i remember thinking to myself eh, it's, a, it's a little contemporary it's a little sloppy you know how these people are behaving but I wanted to blame the writing, you know, I wanted to blame the director, let's say, or the writer, as opposed to understanding that that is exactly how they have to sound. Because if this is happening for real, I don't know if you're going to find, you know, 40 or 50 racist neo-confederates that are going to learn <laughs> the speech patterns, you know, of that time. And stay in character during their entire experience that they're doing. And same, obviously, the slaves, it's practically impossible. You know, the, you can't do that. Somebody being held prisoner, it would be impossible. However, the general, because he is the main confederate that we're dealing with, 
he puts it on good because he's their leader. So it's almost like you go to Disney and you have these characters, these people like the guy who plays Captain Sparrow walking around the park. You know, he's in character and he tries to stay in character. So this general is trying to stay in character for the benefit of the performance, for the benefit of what he's trying to create amongst his confederates. When she's touching those scratches on the wall of her cabin, the scratches are basically a reproduction that she made of the drawing that her daughter made, the three characters and the airplane. So as she touches those scratches, she's kind of trying to remember her daughter and her and her husband. Another thing to keep in mind that I didn't think about at the time is when those Confederate troops are coming to the tent, when they're walking towards the tent and when they're inside the tent, you never really see any injured troops. These guys are coming back from some battle, you imagine. And even the general, you know, he's like, look, we, we, we won the battle. We have this jacket of the, of the enemy. and But you don't really see any injured people. So that should have also been a hint that, you know, is it that they're just not showing it to us? Is it that they're just showing the uninjured soldiers coming in for their meal? Again, that would have been another clue of that something's not right here. Now, another thing I believe I heard in the supplementals is that some of those background characters that we might see during the modern time sequences, especially, I think, the guy that delivers the flowers, I think that is another character that is in this plantation as a confederate. I don't remember exactly who he could be i would have to watch the movie again or figure out uh, figure it out somehow where he is at but yeah that's something that kind of got thrown in there i'm not sure if the the guy in the bar is also one but the apparently i think the guy with the flowers the, the delivery guy was one too obviously the flowers that were delivered to her that were not from her husband they were basically part of the plan to give her a hint of what was coming it's i know it's it's kind of weird. Her friend telling us about how the, you know, you live multiple lives in history and you can be two two different people and blah blah blah. That's basically a red herring. That's there to kind of throw us off the scent of what exactly is happening. That is there to purposely make us think that this is a situation where she's like in her mind traveling back in time, back and forth in time. If you think about it, she is branded. She has been branded. The name on the brand, if you remember earlier, is BD. Blake Denton. Going back to the the, the daughter, the creepy little girl, <laughs> who, uh, man, is she going to need some major therapy after this is all done? The fact that she appears in, in different scenes and we're not sure if she's a ghost or she's a, an, a, an imagined character, and the fact that in all reality, she did show up to the hotel. She didn't imagine her. That's a little weak, I think. The fact that they would throw her there to tease or to taunt your main character before she's kidnapped. It's a little bit of a cheat. I understand that. They make you think that she is a ghost or she's something weird. They're they're, they're kind of pulling you in that direction just to throw you off. I get that. But what's interesting is also earlier on when, was it Elizabeth? I forget her name. She was doing the interview, the, the computer interview. And they're talking to each other, and she sees the little girl walking behind her, and she's like, oh, is that your daughter? And she's like, oh, she's like, oh, yeah, well, uh, she would make a great playmate for your, you know, for my daughter. It's like, okay, I get that there. Now you kind of see that she's kind of thinking, wow, I wonder if we can get her daughter too. (laughs) It's like, oh, my God, that's how creepy that scene really is. It's creepier than you even think it is. There is a quilt, I believe... That is in her house, that is also in her cabin. Now, I don't know if that's for story purposes or just to kind of make the viewer connect the two to make that connection a little more, but it doesn't make any sense that they were able to get it in order to be there for it. So that's kind of like a weird possible mistake. So this is one of those movies where, and I guess if you think of like The Sixth Sense is one of these movies where... You do sometimes want to watch it a second time to catch all the clues because it's full of clues. This movie is completely full of clues. What I love most about it is the fact that up until that third act, I was trying to figure it out because I always try to, I'm always, it's almost like I can't even enjoy myself watching a movie because I'm always trying to figure it out, figure out the twist. And in the trailer, 
I got the impression that they're trying to make these two things work together. And the only two possible conclusions that I would have is, again, either the ghost or the back in time scenario. So a movie like Somewhere in Time, where the guy's going back in time, back and forth, back and forth. Here, I love the fact that you take a subject like racial injustice and slavery in the South. I mean, it's a perfect example, especially, you know, in the area where I live. That is something that's in the news. It's very prominent. It's in your face. It's very timely historically right now. And granted, remember, this movie was made before this past summer. But the other thing that was great was that the sequence where you have the blood and soil. And I was convinced that blood and soil, it was a reference to the Civil War soldiers. So I'm like, oh, look, they're being explicit about how and where this chant came from. But then when I looked it up, and it reinforced to me that that's the connection. That is a connection that we know it now because that's where it came from. But then when I looked it up, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. It says here that it is a Nazi thing. It is not a civil. It doesn't have a civil war origin. It was something from Nazi Germany. You know, it's an anti-Semitic, you know, kind of thing. And then when you kind of put that together... And it's like, well, wait a minute, that would have been a huge hint if I would have understood that at the time, because there's no way that these Civil War soldiers would have known, you know, that chant. It would have brought you directly to the present, you know. So, wow, that is a huge clue that I completely missed really early on the story, that later on, as I look into it more and research it a little more, you know, it, it makes it even better. It's like, wow, I had that there all along and I missed it. And the fact that they kept me going all the way to the third act, and even through the third act, you're still trying to say, but wait a minute, are we blending these two things? How are they being, somehow they're being blended, but I can't tell how the blending works. And then you realize when you're dealing with those cell phone scenes, you're like, okay, the 911 scene, you know, calling the husband, all that stuff. You're like, okay, I get it. This is some kind of rich psychopath who's living out his southern, you know, plantation white supremacy fantasies by kidnapping people. Again, I go back to the, well, how many people honestly think this can succeed? You know, the people that are participating in these, are these like crazy confederates? Or are these crazy rich guys who want to pretend to be Confederates? The fact that you had so many people of different ages, you know, a lot of young people for the soldiers, makes me believe that, no, you're probably dealing, I mean, the, the logic is that you're dealing with white supremacist Confederates. That's, that's what you're dealing with, people who actually do want to return to that sort of thing. And granted, again, not to get political, but if you look at the political numbers of how things ended up, there are still millions of people who I think would love to be able to go back to that sort of thing. But this isn't the episode to get political. I love this film. This is a great film. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I first I rented it, you know, I Netflixed it, <laughs> and then I bought it, and then I watched it a second time with my son, and he also loved it. And, and he had a similar reaction. He was like, well, it's okay, but then, then it got really good when you figure out the twist. The twist sells this movie as far as I'm concerned. I still cannot comprehend the backlash that it got of the negative reaction to it. I don't know if enough people saw it. I don't know why, but it's like when I watch the supplemental material and I see and I listen to all the things that the creators of the film, the director, the producers, everybody was trying to do, it did exactly what they wanted to do as far as I'm concerned. So... I'm really looking forward to see what these guys are going to do next. The cast was great. The music, I can't stress enough the music. The music is there. Man, every now and then you get a movie where there's a theme that, boom, it just hits it exactly where it should be. So this is my review of Antebellum, and it is an unexpectedly good, gushing review of this movie. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed today's movie review of Antebellum. This was a very unexpected movie. Did not imagine being so interested in it that I would devote so much time to it. But uh, I love when a movie surprises the hell out of me, and this one did. And it also did the same thing happened to my son when he watched it. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. 
I can't wait to see what else comes out of these filmmakers. And I hope I have uh, future movies like this uh, to be able to share with you. So, as I mentioned before, this is a big, big thumbs up kind of film. So, thank you guys for listening, and I will see you here soon at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. We're expected to be seen, not heard. But we are the future. Our time is now. I'm coming! I can tell you're special. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2020. <laughs>